So welcome to um, my 2020 field trip, uh, which will be uh, more of a field lecture uh, given the uh, circumstances. In the past, I've given tours of the Lamont Darty Earth Observatory campus uh, to show what some of the clues of the last ice age or the last ice sheet that covered the New York metropolitan area. My name is Mike Kaplan, and I am a research professor, research scientist at Lamont Darty. And my specialty is looking in the past ice age and past glaciers, past climate changes, and how they affected landscapes. And I've worked mainly in South America and Antarctica. I've worked quite a bit in the Canadian Arctic. And some of the clues I look for are very similar, whether um, in this area around New York or um, working in South America. Antarctica is a little different because there's an ice sheet there today, obviously. So obviously there was an ice sheet in the past. But when you're in the New York area, there are actually abundant clues that there was an ice sheet during the last ice age and it affected and caused changes in the landscape. Two lines of evidence I'll talk about today include evidence of the glaciers eroding uh, everything underneath them. And this is a picture from Empire Rock in the southwest part of Central Park, which some of you may have been to, and they show nice glacial grooves caused by the ice sheet. And on the right side are, is a large glacial boulder that the glacier left behind uh, with me actually after coming out of Antarctica before I shaved my beard. So just for some background, uh, this is a illustration uh, from the literature of the Laurentide ice sheet, which is the ice sheet that covered most of North America and Greenland in light gray. Uh, you can see New York City is right at the edge of the ice sheet, and I'll present the evidence of that today. Cities such as Chicago and Toronto and Boston are well behind the ice sheet. One could ask, uh, it's an interesting question, to ask what was the thickness of the ice sheet? How thick was it in various areas? And in New York City, as I'll explain today, the ice sheet terminated or it ended. So you could say it was zero feet to however thick it was at the New York City Westchester border. Uh, these are cities uh, that were well behind the margin of the ice sheet when it was at its maximum expansion. Uh, Toronto, uh, which was around 2,000 meters, uh, which is around uh, 8,000 feet, uh, more or less. Chicago was around 900 meters, around 3,000 feet, more or less. And you could see Boston and Montreal. Given Montreal was so far behind the terminus of the ice sheet, its thickness is estimated at around 3,000 meters or about 10,000 feet more or less. These are, are estimates, uh, rough estimates. They're actually, it's actually difficult to determine exactly how thick the ice sheet, but we do have ways to do that using computer models. This is a, a view of what uh, the edge of the ice sheet looked like over Long Island. You can see here it, it covered uh, Manhattan and the Bronx, and it crossed Staten Island through Brooklyn and Queens. And there's so much water stored in the ice sheets during the last ice age that, as some of you may know, the sea level was much lower. So at the peak of the ice age, around 20,000, or this figure shows 26,000 years ago, sea level or the coastline was much farther away compared to where it is now. So you would have had a large land area exposed just off of what is today Long Island. This is another view of what sea level looked like during the Ice Age. So here to help orient is Florida and the east coast of the United States. And in green is the present land configuration. But during the peak of the Ice Age, the black line indicates where sea level was. So you can see a much more expansive uh, continental shelf during the peak of the last Ice Age. And again, that was because much of the water, the ice sheets that covered North America and Europe and elsewhere were so large that they stored about 400 feet worth of uh, equivalent uh, sea level. So sea level was about 350 to 400 feet lower at the peak of the Ice Age. Now I thought I'd just spend a minute talking about uh, what a glacier is, how they form, uh, for those not familiar. 
A glacier forms ultimately due to snowfall at high elevations. So this is an example of a glacier in a mountain taken from this website. And if snow doesn't melt at the end of a summer, and this happens after many, many summers, eventually the snow starts to build up. And when it builds up thick enough, it will, the compression of the overlying snow will cause the underlying snow to slowly convert to what's called fern and eventually ice. And so a glacier really forms due to snowfall accumulating over time, and the weight of the snow eventually causes enough compaction and increase in density of what's underneath to cause an uh, increase to the density of, of what is ice. Now, eventually that ice will build up enough that it will start to flow downhill. And when that happens, when the ice becomes thick enough that it starts to flow downhill, we can call it a glacier. So this illustration shows how the glacier is building up in what we call the accumulation zone at higher elevations, and it's flowing down to lower elevations. And what I want you to note at the, at, in the front or where the glacier is terminating, uh, which we call the ablation zone, or you could call it the tongue of the glacier, we get buildup of sediment because the glacier is like a conveyor belt. It's moving downhill, rocks are falling on it, or, or in the case of, of what I'll talk about today, the glacier is eroding what's underneath it, and it carries that material to the front because the glacier is actually moving downhill or flowing towards the front. But when it gets to the front, the ice ablates or melts during the summer, and it leaves the sediment behind. And if it stays in one place long enough, it will build up what's called a moraine or a terminal moraine at the maximum extent. The first line of evidence I'll mention that we find uh, around New York are what we call striations or glacial grooves. They're evidence that the ice sheet was flowing over the rock or flowing over the area. And the bottom of the ice sheet's quite dirty, if you remember from the previous illustration. And that's because the glacier carries a lot of sediment, again, that it's either eroded from the bottom or its base, or for a smaller glacier, that's fallen from cliffs that are along the side. And this debris at the bottom of the glacier will scratch the rock underneath it. So it's carrying these boulders, and these boulders are scratching the rock underneath it. So the example on the left side is from the cloisters in northern Manhattan, which some of you may have been to. And the glacial striations or grooves are flowing from the sort of the bottom left of the photo towards the upper right of the photo. And here's a geologic rock hammer for scale. This is the back, this is the west side of the cloisters uh, as the road starts to curve around the museum. On the right side are two pictures I've taken of, from South America. And you can see this is a boulder that was being carried along the bottom of the ice sheet as it was flowing towards the margin. And it's scratching the rock underneath it. And the bottom is another photo I took of the rock. One thing that could be com complicated or confusing, and you, you might have this in the New York area when you're looking for striations, is the rock may have its own lineations or foliations, if you will, what we call it rock structure. And in this case, this rock going from the bottom towards the boulder, you could see the rock has its own structure, so to speak. But if you look from the left to the right, you could see this rock was causing scratches in the bedrock underneath. So these scratches, which are more from the upper left to the lower right, were caused by the boulder being dragged across this rock uh, by the ice sheet flowing. So this is a case where we were able to distinguish uh, what's the, the rock itself, the, the bedding, if you will, or the we say the structure of the rock, from these scratches, which were caused by this boulder being dragged across the rock as it was carried by the glacier. So these boulders are obviously not in the glacier anymore. The glacier had retreated, leaving these sediments behind. And that's what I took a picture of. So this sort of evidence, whether you're in the cloisters in Northern Manhattan, or, or there are excellent uh, examples at Orchard Beach in the Bronx, or in South America is the same. This evidence of a glacier causing these glacier striations or grooves is similar whether I'm taking a photo in South America or at the cloisters. Now you can use these striations or grooves to learn about which way the ice sheet was flowing overall. And these are two examples I've taken from uh, the literature. On the left is when the ice sheet in blue is at its maximum extent. And the orange line 
is what we call a terminal moraine, which some of you may be familiar with across the Staten Island and central Brooklyn, Queens into Long Island. And when the ice sheet was at its maximum, around 26, 25, 20,000 years ago, it was flowing more or less northwest to southeast. It covered the entire landscape. And these are the directions, this is the direction of the striations we find at the cloisters or in the east side of the Bronx at Orchard Beach and other striations you might find along Northern Long Island. The figure on the right is when the ice sheet just started to retreat a little bit. You can see this, this is the terminal moraine. The blue is, is where the ice sheet was. It's now at Northern Staten Island and just south of the, the tip of Manhattan. In this case, there's evidence that the ice sheet was flowing more from north to south. And this may have been because it was thinner and more affected by topography. I think in the area, if you find striations or glacial grooves, they're more likely to be when the ice sheet was at its maximum extent. The other line of evidence, whether I'm in, in Harriman State Park or in South America, are things called glacial boulders or what we call glacial erratics. And we call them glacial erratics because they don't seem to belong where you find them. In this case, uh, this is a sandstone. This is Harriman State Park, uh, Northern Rockland County. And underneath it is, is more of a granite and a gneiss, which is most of the bedrock, much of the bedrock in Harriman State Park. So this sandstone was probably carried down from the Catskills. So it doesn't seem to belong where it's found today. This is the Bronx in Pelham Bay Park near Orchard Beach. Uh, this was the opening photo with me and my Antarctic beard. And this rock has a plaque on it and the plaque is actually sh discussing that it's called Glover's Rock. And it's there's interesting history around this area for those who have been to Orchard Beach. This is where during the Revolutionary War, the, the British Army came onto the continent itself, right near this rock. So the rock is discussing uh, the history uh, related to the Revolutionary War and the British first coming onto the main part of the continent. Given that the Bronx and Westchester, what well, was Westchester at the time, are part of the mainland. There are other examples in Brooklyn and Queens of the Ice Age and the former ice sheet. For those of you who've been to Forest Park in central Queens, this is looking up towards the terminal moraine. So on the left, I'm looking up towards the terminal moraine and on the right, we're walking down the terminal moraine. This is Prospect Park in Brooklyn, which I'm sure most of the, many of the folks who are watching this have been to. And you can see this hummocky topography is characteristic of a moraine. Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, some of you might be familiar with this area. Anyone's noticed when you're driving through central Brooklyn and central Queens, you often see cemeteries. And this is an example of Greenwood Cemetery. And the cemeteries in central Brooklyn and central Queens, some of them lie on the terminal moraine of the ice sheet. They represent how far the ice sheet expanded during the last ice age. And I speculate that some of the cemeteries are built on the terminal moraine uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that they're not good for farming. Moraines tend to be very rocky, a lot more debris and sediment that has to be cleared. And it also tends to have a lot more topography or it tends to be a lot hillier as some of you may notice from this photo and what I showed from Prospect Park. And so I speculate that the farmers had a, a harder time clearing these areas, so they tended to be good for cemeteries. The other reason is they tend to be well-drained. Water doesn't tend to build up on the moraine itself. They may on ponds uh, within the moraine, but for most of the moraine, the sediment, glacial sediments tend to be, not always, but they tend to be relatively well-drained. And for obvious reasons, that would be a good characteristic for putting a cemetery on a site. So I thought I'd end today's lecture by showing you Lamont Darty Earth Observatory, the location uh, along the Hudson River. And the top image is a Google Street View, We're looking from Dobbs Ferry westward towards Lamont Darty, south of Nyack. And in the lower left is a photo I took from the same place, looking down southward towards the city in the background and the Palisades Cliffs on the right. Now one can ask the question, is the Hudson River a fjord? Uh, it's sort of a trick question, if you will. And the reason you can ask this question is because in some places, 
it does have characteristics of a fjord. Uh, this is the lower Hudson River before it reaches New York City. But if you go to the north around West Point or north of West Point, where the Hudson Highlands crosses the river, it has some characteristics of a fjord. So to summarize briefly what the general definition of a fjord is, a fjord is a, a valley that's been widened and deepened by a glacier or, uh, or an ice sheet near the coastline. And it's deepened to the point where the bottom of the valley will be below sea level when sea level comes up after the ice age. So the ice sheet uh, covers this area. It then eventually disappears, as we know, because the ice sheet's not covering the Hudson River today. And the ice sheet eroded the bottom of the river and winded also uh, so deep that the sea level, when it comes up, the bottom is actually below the current sea level. So from that general definition or that characteristic, you can say the Hudson River is like a fjord. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the, or have seen pictures of, or been to the fjords of Norway, or seen photos or been to the fjords in Alaska. Now, some would argue that Hudson River is not a true fjord because it's filled by most of its length. It's, it's actually filled by the Hudson River. It's not fully filled by sea, the sea or salt water. Now, the salt water does tend to flow along the bottom at least. Some of you may know that the tides go all the way up to Albany. So it's, it's mainly riverine with uh, some characteristics of an estuary or salt along the salty water along the bottom at least. And so from that point, from the water characteristics, it's not truly a fjord. But from general definition of a valley, the bottom of which is below sea level, it certainly fits that definition. So that's all I had to say today. Hopefully you learned something about how the, or the clues or the evidence we use uh, to look for whether an ice sheet or a glacier cover an area. I should end the talk by saying a, a glacier and an ice sheet are really the, uh, the same thing. Just an ice sheet is such a big glacier or such a large glacier that it covers much of a continent. I want to thank my colleagues at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and uh, colleagues in other areas I work in, such as South America and other sites. Much of my research in South America and elsewhere is funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation, so I'd like to thank them as well. Thank you, and hopefully you enjoy the rest of the open house.